This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And it's a, a real pleasure to be able to speak with uh, you here today, at least virtually. And I uh, just want to say before I start, I have several connections to Cornell uh, that make this especially meaningful to me. I, first of all, grew up in New York State. So I love visiting the Cornell campus. It, it makes me feel at home. I'm also personally supporting the university financially. Uh, my son is a junior at Cornell. And uh, one benefit is I, I got this awesome jacket. Let's see. It's a great layer today, I have to say. Uh, so that's a perk. And, uh, but most importantly, there's such a great extensive faculty at Cornell in plant sciences that I've been actually hoping to visit my son and spend time talking with people there on a deeper basis. Um, but uh, the, the pandemic has hindered that, of course. Um, but I know people like Dan Classic and Greg Martin from my postdoc days, and I uh, lived across the street from Eric Richards for a time, and there are just so many great uh, faculty members at Cornell. So I'm honored to, to be invited today. So what I want to talk about is how we work at Two Blades in particular about putting science into action against crop diseases. And so to frame that up, I want to give a little context by putting crop disease in terms of food systems and crop production, how disease fits into that, the gap that Two Blades works to address and the challenges to the work that we're trying to do. So um, let's see, first of all, uh, I wanna say that uh, agricultural production has really scaled phenomenally. We, we can start here and say, how well since the beginning of mankind uh, and the growth of the population to today of uh, over seven and a half billion people, agriculture has really kept up for the most part with feeding uh, all, of, all of the people on the planet. And this has been due to, on the one hand, increase in land under production and the use of things like fertilizer, but also in no small part to genetics. But we know that there are challenges. Uh, we know that the top population will continue to grow, uh, leveling off at around 10 billion before uh, it's, it's done increasing. And that most of that growth is going to happen in Africa. And as the population grows, we know that the uh, available land for uh, agricultural production is not increasing. So that means that we have to grow more food on proportionately less land and feeding more people at the same time. So uh, there's a connection there to crop disease, which is it suggests a trend towards sustainable intensification. And that can mean using uh, land to grow crops at a greater density, which is a potential for uh, disease to spread throughout there. Um, there's also an opportunity as we think about increasing population because Africa, where most of that population growth is occurring or is expected to occur is also where most of the world's poor and ultra poor are today. And we know that agricultural is a really significant tool for reducing poverty. Other production challenges, climate change. Uh, in some parts of the world, it's expected that changing climate and temperatures will have a positive impact on yields in, in temperate areas, uh, but also negative impacts on yields in more tropical areas. Uh, a kind of crop disease connection with climate is the fact that we know that because of climate change, regions have been moving, they've been on the move. Uh, Sarah Gurr and coworkers have showed that since the 1960s, in fact, fungal pathogens have been moving from the equator towards the pole at a rate of three kilometers a year. So that suggests that there's emerging threats, new diseases to new areas. It's also, of course, concerning to see crop losses in the areas that are already struggling to feed their populations, and they're going to be hit by this as well. Another challenge in the world and food systems is the problem of abundance versus scarcity. Uh, so this is a calorie map of the world caloric intake, and you can see how distinct it is in different areas in the world today. 820 million people go to bed hungry every night. We have a significant amount of hunger. We also have up to 2 billion people who suffer from micronutrient deficiency. 
and uh, a significant chunk of those are children. And the impacts of that are going to be on stunting and wasting, which will impact them the rest of their lives. So today we have issues compounded with the other issues I've just mentioned. At the same time, we also have issues with uh, overnutrition, if you want to call it that. Uh, diseases uh, like uh, obesity and, and overweight becoming a real plague, especially in wealthy countries where you have high caloric intake. Um, but ironically, also in some poor areas which are switching their diets now and are quite susceptible to uh, issues of um, non-communicable diseases from obesity and heart disease and so forth. Now, the connection here with crop disease is that because these non-communicable diseases are enormous problems, significant problems for healthcare, uh, that they receive a lot of attention and priority in countries like the US, and that makes them a priority for funding. Another challenge is from food uh, waste and loss. We've heard the figures that 30% of all food is lost in the form of food waste, uh, which seems like a, a, a travesty, of course, uh, to throw away 30% of what's produced. Uh, but when you take a look closer, um, as represented in this graph, uh, what you see is actually there's two situations, two uh, real causes underneath it. In the left-hand side in the industrialized countries, you can see that the losses are primarily at the consumer, where a lot of food is thrown away. And much less of it is to do with production in the yellow box at the bottom. If you look at the other end of the spectrum in the poorer countries, it's quite the opposite. So uh, what you have here is, um, in terms of a connection to crop disease, you have an assumption perhaps in wealthy countries that uh, we're producing too much. We don't need to produce as much. We're throwing away food. Can't that food be shared or, or saved? Uh, and it deprioritizes support for plant breeding and innovation and production in general. Uh, but you can see if you look at these poor countries where most of the loss is occurring in production or in handling and storage, uh, it's a really different set of problems. Uh, and, and crop disease is also a factor in trying to secure the crops. So in summary, crop diseases, in my opinion, are a significant and underrecognized threat to food security. And overall, globally, we lose about 15% on average uh, of production to crop diseases, but that's an average and individual diseases can cause 70%, 80% losses, even total crop failure. And here, are just three examples. Uh, of course, late blight of potato is the granddaddy of all crop diseases. We all know about the Irish potato famine in which the uh, late blight um, outbreaks of those years in the 1840s were a major contributor to famine uh, and starvation there. Uh, but it's not just something in the past. We still have new strains and outbreaks today in Bangladesh and the US. It's an ongoing problem. Uh, soybean, uh, on the other side, is a case of a top 10 commodity crop which is susceptible to Asian soybean rust, which can cause losses of up to 80%. And it's a huge user of fungicides. And wheat, which represents 20% of the global calories and protein, is threatened by different rusts. Stem and stripe rust in particular can cause catastrophic and chronic losses. Uh, and many of the varieties are susceptible and can cause losses uh, over 50%. And, and it's a really significant crop for food right up there uh, with rice is the most important food crop. These losses have impact, large economic impact globally. Uh, these are a couple specific diseases and the kinds of annual, annual losses that uh, they are reported to have. The FAO reports that in total, annually, about $220 billion in economic losses caused by crop disease. It's also a problem for smallholder farmers. And smallholder farmers are defined by farming uh, areas of less than five acres or two hectares. And um, I have that backwards, don't I? Uh, sorry, small farms anyway. And the average annual income 
uh, under about $2,500 a year and supporting about five people per farmer. So in total, affecting about two and a half billion people on the planet are uh, fed through smallholder farmers. But smallholder farmers uh, don't necessarily produce a small contribution to the world's crops. They can be up to 80% of the work force in a country. Um, they also can produce up to 60 to 80% of some of the world's crops, such as rice, cassava, and millet. And these are all done on small um, five hectare farms. Um, and smallholders have fewer options than large commercial farmers. They may not have access to resistant varieties or chemicals to control diseases. Uh, or if they do have access, they may be too expensive, or they could be not stored correctly. Um, and so these people are particularly at risk of hunger and food insecurity. But you can imagine how devastating it could be if you're someone who's just barely producing enough for yourself and your family to lose 10% of your crop would be bad. And uh, certainly 70% would be devastating. So how, what are the practices to mitigate disease? Of course, there are some. Uh, first off, uh, good management practices and prevention, um, making sure as much as possible you have good soil health is, is fundamental. Using tools such as crop rotation, intercropping, good sanitary measures, barriers, and so forth are ways to reduce the amount of crop disease. Chemicals are a major tool that uh, agriculture uses, that crop protection industry is, is very big for a reason. Chemicals do work. Um, uh, chemicals, of course, can be, uh, become uh, less effective over time, just as well as resistances can. Um, but still, we use them. They're an important tool in the toolbox of protecting crops. In fact, annually, the world spends over $15 billion on crop protection chemicals, uh, but still, it only partially uh, is effective at, at uh, controlling diseases. And that's on a large scale. On a small scale, you have uh, farmers out there trying to protect crops as well. Uh, there you can see in these images that uh, uh, they don't always have access or know uh, how to use protective gear correctly or to store chemicals. Uh, so it's not a perfect answer. Another tool, of course, is genetic resistance. And uh, crop breeding itself as a science got started in the early 1900s with Sir Roland Biffin. And in fact, he was breeding for disease resistance. So uh, in the grand scale of history, it's a relatively young discipline, um, but he made major contributions as did Norman Vorlog uh, to focusing on conventional breeding for rust diseases of cereals. Uh, and really these three, different methods are all important measures to uh, control crop diseases. Two blades were really interested in genetics in particular, and so I'll be talking more about that. And uh, you can imagine how much science has advanced since the time of Biffin and, and even Borlaug. Uh, science at places like Cornell uh, and also at the Sainsbury Lab where we do a lot of our work has massively increased our understanding of plant disease and plant immunity. And that understanding of, of the mechanics of the interaction is so important to create meaningful disease resistance. Uh, and I'm just gonna highlight a couple of key actors here in our molecular understanding. And that's on the one hand, um, the pathogen associated molecular patterns, PAMPs, are uh, fragments of pathogens that are recognized uh, on the cell surface by receptors called PRRs or uh, pattern recognition receptors. Um, and these recognize the presence of pathogens and initiate a response called PTI or um, PAM triggered immunity to trigger defense responses. And there are also internal receptors, the NLRs or nucleotide binding site leucine rich repeat proteins, which are receptors for um, effectors that are introduced into the cell by different kinds of uh, pests and diseases. And uh, NLRs recognize the presence of these effectors and trigger ETI or effector triggered immunity. And the general contribution of these two is they work together. Um, and it, this is still an area where the knowledge is continuing to be extend, expanded. But from the 
uh, disease resistance perspective, what we generally think of is that PTI can confer broader uh, but less um, high level resistance in crops. So it can recognize multiple species uh, and provide some level of resistance, but not to the same level as the race specific resistance that's conferred by NLRs. Um, but that is very specific. So they're both useful in breeding. And that's just captured here in this slide that shows soybean on the left and uh, green beans on the right. And you can see that the soybean is affected by Asian soybean rust, but it's a close relative with bean and the bean is unaffected. And of course, from our knowledge, uh, we expect that this is conditioned now by the presence of NLRs and PRs in, in one plant and not in another. And of course, much of conventional breeding has aimed to identify these resistances and introgress them. And that process has improved over time with tools like molecular markers and, and so forth. But a potential limitation is that maybe resistance isn't always present in a crop. And you might wanna look more broadly as in this uh, example I'm showing here uh, to other crops where you might want to um, introduce resistance and it's not interfertile. Uh, and so you would engineer resistance transgenically. <clears throat> and there's been a history, uh, this is an outdated table I put together a while back, but, but it, it makes this point which is there have been lots of examples of engineered resistance of different kinds in a number of crops um, into the field and greenhouse and so forth. Uh, so there's a, a history of showing this, but a poor history of getting those results to market. And really it's only since the 1900s, or sorry, the, the 1990s, <laughs> uh, where some um, disease resistant crops reached market, squash, and papaya, and they've, they've been around ever since. Uh, and in all that intervening time, there's been only one new uh, transgenic resistance that's reached market in recent years, and that was uh, resistance uh, to late blight by Simplot. So this shows you that there, there's, there's a gap that uh, exists. And this is really where Two Blades comes in. We um, want to address this gap and our ability to come into this, per, uh, into this problem uh, was really initiated by Roger Friedman, our founder and chairman. Uh, Roger has spent his career as an advisor to David Sainsbury uh, and David's charitable organization, the Gatsby Foundation. And between uh, Roger and the Gatsby Foundation, they established the Sainsbury Laboratory in Norwich about 28 years ago which was explicitly focused on um, looking at the molecular plant microbe interactions uh, between plants and, and pathogens. And so Roger has had the uh, vantage point of seeing the science develop and seeing that gap in translation. So he and I worked together uh, prior to establishing Two Blades, but he invited me to come and help him set up this idea of Two Blades. And we have a small but excellent team of people and one of the things that characterizes us and what we try to do is that we have a combination of experience in science and business. And when we started Two Blades in 2003, this was pretty much the, the landscape. We knew that there was all this new knowledge about plant pathogen interactions and genomic tools and, and so on, uh, but it really wasn't getting into agriculture. And so we established Two Blades to bridge that gap and successfully take those uh, advances and create long lasting resistance. And coming back to this image, we draw a lot of our knowledge and expertise from, from understanding this area and how we exploit and translate that into our mission, which is we are a nonprofit organization and we uh, function in two ways to bring that technology forward on plant disease to benefit food security. Uh, and, and we have a two-pronged approach, a two-pronged business model. Um, we work on commercial disease resistant targets with seed companies. Uh, and we also separately, or not always separately, best of all is if it, it's both, um, we can affect disease issues of smallholder farmers in developing countries. And in the one situation, we will do this essentially at a fair market rate, we'll earn income and 
uh, that will help to pay for programs where we're doing it for smallholder farming and we expect to give things away. And there we're partnering with other government agencies uh, and charitable foundations. And this came together essentially as a new model for advancing science for, for broad benefit. So what exactly do we do? We set up programs of research where we can see molecular um, a basis for conferring resistance uh, and have the right partners and can, can have a feasible approach to uh, a disease solution. And we advance that. We do that by keeping a, a product development focus. So think about what's going to be feasible from a, a product point of view. Uh, in, in essence, we're like an ag biotech company, but we're, we're nonprofit. Uh, and we support the projects that we take on with project management support. We undertake the business development aspects and contracts. We manage intellectual property where there is some and where it's not serving just the project at hand. We also do technology licensing, in, in and out licensing. Uh, we support contract research and of course, we have to support these programs with funding. So in this process of translating uh, science to the field, uh, we have a lab group uh, at the Sainsbury Laboratory um, embedded there. And uh, this is a great environment. Not only is it part of our stable of uh, related enterprises, uh, between Two Blades, the Gatsby Foundation, and, and the Sainsbury Lab, we're all kind of united through uh, uh, David Sainsbury. Um, but this has been a laboratory that's been very successful at producing fundamental knowledge in this field. So it's a great place for us to have a laboratory embedded there and um, provides a rich environment. We, so we, we have a group there. We also collaborate with a lot of universities and public research organizations. And this is just a little snapshot of our, our network. And um, in addition to the academic and the, and the kind of science end of the spectrum input and collaborators, we have the kind of the delivery partners, which are large and small companies, uh, as well as members uh, of the CGIAR. And overall, we have partnered with about 20 universities, 20 companies, and the four CG centers in about 16 countries. Um, and this represents just our contractual partnerships. Uh, it, it doesn't get into our informal networks too, but uh, it's a great, great collaborative environment. And people seem to appreciate an organization that's trying to create benefit uh, for all of agriculture. And, and so everybody has been super cooperative at trying to work within the various programs that we've been running. We've had great support from uh, funding initially said from, from the Gatsby Foundation and David Sainsbury, uh, but that's been leveraged now with other grants and with business income and so forth. So here are some of the solutions that we've produced to date. Uh, we've addressed some of the major unmanaged diseases of major crops using different approaches, some of them um, in uh, transgenic, some of them uh, otherwise with different kinds of strategies. And I'll get into that in a little bit of detail in a moment. Um, also another activity that we've had is along the way, we need to develop new tools for doing this work, better tools to work more efficiently. And that's led us to um, new methods for cloning resistance genes. Uh, we actually working through disease resistance with some of our partners uh, we came connected to the TAL effector code and TALENS is a gene editing platform that came from Xanthomonas, as, as many of you uh, probably know. Uh, and that's been a great tool for both gene editing and for coming up with strategies for gene regulation. And uh, just to kind of have a momentary aside on that, um, to exemplify how we approach things like in property and enabling technologies. So in this when we look about the TAL effector code, <clears throat> it turns out the uh, scientists uh, at Martin Luther University who had discovered it, Ulla Bonus, Jens Bach, Thomas Lahai, and Sebastian Shornach, um, they had the responsibility to develop their invention themselves at that time. The German patent law uh, was, uh, it didn't go to the university, first of all. 
they were not sure how to exploit this invention um, and, and they could see and we could see that it had tremendous potential. We were grateful that we learned about it from them before that they published. And so we worked together with them. And what this graph is showing, uh, this figure is showing that from their invention, what we uh, worked out was that we split the rights exclusively. So the two blades got the plant rights and the inventors kept the non-plant rights. And then we worked together to get them out into broadest use. And so uh, with one partner, Thermo Fisher, uh, formerly Life Technologies, we licensed all of the rights for non-plants, which commercial applications, uh, gene therapies and so forth, together with uses and production of reagents, both for non-plants and plants, so that they could make tau molecules uh, available. And Two Blades retained the commercial plant rights. And we undertook um, a process of non-exclusive licensing in kind of a unique model there. We had uh, a series of licenses that we did with small and large companies. It was scaled based on the size of their sales basically, uh, so that it was a fair market value uh, for each level. And we had a very simple licensing strategy, it had upfront fees, but no royalties or milestones. And in this case, and in all of the way we operate with industry, we have grant backs of rights for two blades to use all uses uh, at our discretion for uh, developing agricultural applications. So in terms of programs, we've taken a common theme throughout. And though there are many useful uh, tools in the breeding toolkit, uh, all of which uh, you know, we endorse and are needed. We focused in on one and that's really to create multi-gene stacks. And we do this because we understand that you should never bet against the pathogen. Um, single gene resistance can be short-lived, it can be overcome in a single season. So we want to try to reduce the odds that a pathogen can evolve to overcome a single gene resistance by not only pyramiding our genes, but combining them into a single locus. And that's why they won't segregate in further breeding and, and um, uh, become ineffective, but we keep that stack together uh, to ensure that we produce durable resistance. And I'll talk about one specific example, the work that we've been doing in wheat stem rust uh, I know there's a lot of activity in wheat stem rust at Cornell, so I uh, try not to go into too much background here. I know you're familiar with it, but uh, of course, wheat stem rust was something, a problem that was solved uh, in essence by Norman Borlaug back in the 50s and, and central part of the Green Revolution, um, uh, varieties resistant to stem rust. But uh, unfortunately, these varieties were overcome. The resistance was overcome in 1998 first in Uganda by a new race of the pathogen. And ultimately this race spread and mutated further uh, to 13 different uh, strains of, of stem rust in um, uh, over 13 countries throughout Africa and into the Middle East and represents a major, major threat to wheat production worldwide. There's been progress on finding disease resistance in a number of wheat and wheat relatives, and increasingly more and more genes have been cloned from these different sources. And Two Blades has been interested in trying to amass a bunch of uh, these different genes to put together into multi-gene cassettes. And in this image, I show four NLR genes represented by the little hook uh, image um, coming from these different sources that uh, we've worked together with CSIRO to put together into a multi-gene cassette together with um, another uh, APR resistant adult uh, plant resistance gene, which is a hexose transporter uh, to make an initial stack. And uh, that's what this looks like. It's nicknamed Big Five. And this stack was put together um, through uh, a combination strategy and a low copy vector. Uh, that was uh, developed by Michaeliff and colleagues, uh, and, and they have been able to produce an array of gene stack constructs um, through this method. And this is uh, one I'm going to talk about in, in more depth, um, but they've also been able to produce a whole series of these. And uh, Big Five is about a 37 KB insert. That's, that's pretty big. That's why it's difficult to make these stacks. 
uh, but Mick and, and colleagues are able to do up to seven or more genes, uh, up to 60 KV inserts. So this is a great uh, technological advance. So the Big Five stack was put into a wheat variety and that was sent to Minnesota with our colleagues, Brian Stephenson and, and coworkers there to do some field testing. Um, and this just shows the field testing process, getting it out into the nursery and doing some inoculations and ratings. Um, it, it always is uh, exciting to hear Brian Stephenson talk about it. He was so excited about the results. In fact, he said he had to name a new category for rating this hypersensitive resistance because he hadn't seen zero symptoms of uh, stem rust before. Here's a bit more depth on the results from those field trials with the Big Five stack. And uh, what you see here are um, percent of plant infection uh, uh, of the susceptible controls, uh, null lines and the parent lines over two seasons, blue and gray are 2018 and 2019, compared to our multi-gene lines, which really were clean, uh, not showing any uh, symptoms at all. And then these are some of the single transgenes individually tested. And uh, you do see different levels of disease here. Uh, with different genes. SR22 and SR50 really have very low levels and you can see that reproduced here uh, on the leaves in the images themselves. Um, and the APR, which is generally sort of an intermediary phenotype, uh, you can also see that in this image. Um, now, because you can see that not all the genes are providing uh, resistance completely individually, that suggests that it's not quite as strong as we like. And in fact, we do consider this a first stack and not the last stack. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, an observation that happened while we were working on this is that a new, um, a new strain showed up in Sicily that overcame even more of some of the resistance genes, some of which were used in the stack. So this was tested against our uh, big five stack. And while we can see that the stack itself was resistant to this race. If you take it apart into the different individual lines, some of them hold SR22, for example, but we lost three of the five there. And so that's certainly not the leading product we wanna take and develop as uh, something we put in the, in the field. Uh, so we're going to keep working on putting together more stacks and, and really trying to make sure that we have this nailed and possibly in future being able to trade in and out genes as they may become overcome individually. These results were just published last month in, in Nature Biotech. So if you're interested in that, you can um, read up on, on that. And uh, just to make a quick statement that uh, central to this work was some of the cloning work by Mick Aliff. Also on the pathogen side, I didn't really go into details, but Peter and Melania really focused and did a lot of work to understand the effectors and which ones were really critical to virulence. And that's a really key component to understanding these stacks as you can see how quickly they can become overcome. Uh, and uh, a number of others, uh, Brenda for um, identifying resistance genes and the work of Brian Stephenson and colleagues in particular. I'm gonna switch now to one other example and, and just close out shortly with uh, a couple of other examples um, before I take questions. But one of the other pathogens that we've worked on quite a bit is Asian soybean rust. It's uh, something, again, that we put a lot of effort into understanding the pathogen side of things and what effectors are critical. Uh, and this one's been challenging because it's an enormous genome um, and it goes to a lot of different hosts. So there's all kinds of uh, uh, recombination and things going on, uh, giving it a lot of variability. But we took a similar approach, looking um, at where we can find resistance. And in soybean itself, there's not a lot of resistance and those have generally been overcome in their use in the field. So uh, we're looking more broadly across various relatives to soybean. This one is Cajanus cajun or pigeon pea. It's a pretty little plant. And uh, we knew through our collaborator, Sergio Bromenschenkel at, uh, uh, in Brazil, that he had populations of Cajanus that were segregating, could, could segregate for different symptoms of the pathogen. 
And we uh, hypothesized that in there was potentially an NLR gene contributing to resistance. And we went out for map-based cloning. And indeed, we found a gene, an NLR, that we call CCRPP1. And when you put CCRPP1 from Cajanus uh, Cajun into soybean, we can see very strong resistance there. And this is work uh, done at our lab in the Sainsbury lab. Uh, in conjunction with Sergio's lab in Brazil, and together with an industrial partner, in this case, uh, DuPont Pioneer, now Corteva, with the idea that they will take it all the way through to um, uh, product development and uh, with other resistances, again, keeping an eye on the durability. We've since also ended that program with them, and we've started another program with uh, Monsanto, now by our crop science, uh, so we continue to work on, on this pathogen. And then just more briefly, a couple others. Here's some bacterial resistance we've worked on. Uh, Xanthomonas, uh, bacterial spot of tomato, um, uh, have demonstrated in numerous field trials that the pepper gene BS2, which is an NLR, introduced in its close relative of tomato, can confer very strong protection and double the yields of tomatoes in a number of different backgrounds. Uh, another bacterial disease we've used in this case, a PRR protein, EFR, uh, and when we put that into tomato, we can confer protection against Ralstonia, bacterial wilt, which is a pathogen for which there is not a lot of genetic resistance in um, any crop, really, in tomato, uh, and also in potato. Uh, EFR was introduced into potato um, and shown to protect against Ralstonia. EFR has been put into a huge number of crops, including more recently tree crops. Um, we see protection in citrus against citrus canker uh, and xylella, and in apple against erwinia. So it's a good example of how PRRs can be more broad in their resistance, but at a more intermediate level of resistance. So it makes a great combination with NLRs. Uh, lastly, I just want to talk about one other program that we've supported. We haven't driven the science in this case, but this is work to uh, engineer late blight resistance and omicete uh, in potato. And this is work driven by Mark Elaine uh, at the International Potato Center in Nairobi. And he's done a number of trials with a three NLR gene stack uh, that show very tight resistance and in improvement in yields and uh, is close to the market, we hope, within the next few years. Uh, and, and we expect this can improve smallholder farmer income by up to 40%. So this is exciting to see this one move on. Also working with Mark has been a great opportunity to um, get to a, a, an understanding of some of the regulatory considerations in Africa. In the US, of course, we have a working framework, uh, but this is not always the case in a lot of African countries. And although it's sometimes a shifting landscape. Some countries move forward with biosafety regulations and then they may step back. Overall, the trend is showing. I think you can see that more countries are adopting frameworks as an increasing level of green just over the past five years. So what are the challenges we face? I've mentioned some of the technical and regulatory issues. Even in a country like the US where we have a clear regulatory process, it's extremely expensive. Uh, and finding better ways of trying to uh, develop uh, these resistances is a priority uh, and a challenge. How we deliver these resistances for smallholders is a lot less straightforward than trying to do it for commercial ag where we can have a partner and um, they can take it all the way through to market. Adequate funding is a major issue. As I mentioned uh, within there, a lot of the funding, uh, as we know it as plant scientists, goes towards biomedical research and trying to get attention to some of these plant science issues is still a challenge. And that recognition of crop disease in general uh, is, is a challenge. Still, uh, a lot of people don't appreciate, especially in countries that have adequate income to spend on research, that uh, these are important issues. Uh, in fact, if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals or the Copenhagen Consensus, which ranks threats and in, in where investment is uh, going to benefit society the most, crop disease is nowhere to be found. Um, but uh, I was gratified uh, in, in 2019 to hear Bill Gates 
make the statement that pests and diseases are among the biggest challenges that we currently face with our global food systems, uh, and, and that threat's intensifying with climate change. So maybe we're beginning to see some more attention shifting to uh, these problems. I'll just point out that here in this picture uh, next to Bill Gates is David Sainsbury, who has certainly been one of the long-term uh, supporters of this kind of research. So even though there are these challenges and we keep trying to build a pipeline of resistances that we know are effective uh, because we feel that it's the most environmentally benign way to uh, benefit human health and the environment, having these particular uh, impacts protecting harvests and, and food security against chronic and catastrophic losses, ensuring that you can still make gains in productivity in low-income countries where ag is so important, how we face climate change and ensure that there's resilience and we maintain our productivity, and how we do this all uh, with doing more with less as really is part of the challenge that we face today. And this really connects to a lot of the sustainable development goals. So that is where I will stop for today and happy to, uh, to take any questions. Well, thank you so much, Diana. Um, that's really such a fascinating model of research and, and uh, development. And I'm wondering, um, I, I can't see if anybody has questions. Feel free to type in questions um, if you have them. Um, and also, you know, don't don't be shy to just pipe up um, or raise your hand. But meanwhile, I just wanted to ask: Do you have a way of um, comparing the the fundraising approach, the, the model that you mentioned, as a way of sort of mobilizing resources into R and D, as compared to conventional academic work? Is it somehow easier to to, to move product, financial product, and outcome product that, this way, or is it tougher? Would you say? I'd say it has the advantage that it's diversified. And I, you know, unfortunately, especially in the US, I think that the number of sources for funding for research is pretty limited. Uh, and I'm sure uh, I don't have to tell any of you that writing a lot of grants to the same organizations is kind of a small pool. Uh, so we have the advantages in, in effect that we can tap into other resources. We have been able to get grants uh, from different kinds of foundations. And in the one case of um, the Citrus Research and Development Foundation, which funded some of our work that we've done in Citrus, we felt that we had an advantage, a little bit of an advantage there because they were really trying to solve a problem for industry. And we were a little bit more industrial-like. And uh, that I think gave us potentially an advantage there. But we also have the ability to generate business income um, and we do some philanthropy. It's a very, very small amount of, of the work that we do. Uh, it certainly doesn't really help us to fund programs because research is expensive, but it's the diversity I think that helps. Okay. Anybody else have questions or comments? I'll slip in another one while we're waiting for people to uh, get their thoughts into words. Um, any comment on how about the maize stuck in ear rots? What what ways forward do you see on those? Yeah, so yeah, I didn't I didn't go into depth on that one. Apologies, I'm trying to keep it uh, snappy. Um, so just to comment on that, that was another program that we did with Monsanto because those are important targets, disease targets for the U.S. Uh, they they produce significant impacts on yields in the US. So they were keen to have some um, tools to, to fight those diseases. And that was a program that we did for about five, six years and uh, established a platform. Actually, that one was kind of an interesting one because we were using a PRR platform as opposed to the standard NLR uh, kind of approach. And uh, that program wrapped up and, and we, brought it to a successful conclusion with them. And so now it's up to Monsanto to move some of those outcomes from our work through their product development pipeline. Um, but as I've spoken with you, we also hope maybe we can leverage that platform to address other needs in corn, particularly for smallholder issues. And so that's 
why I was interested in, in hearing your perspective about what can we do in terms of the mycotoxin producing fungi and, and developing resistance there. Uh, and, and the other part of that interest that we're looking into is to make gene stacks for fusarium and um, aspergillus, but also for striga, which is another one that would we think could potentially be interesting for smallholders. And, uh, and we hope to be able to benefit from the transgenic pathway that's already been initiated there. Um, it was initially started for drought tolerance uh, in Africa. I uh, actually got a boost because it has BT in it. And so it has insect resistance uh, secondarily, but that turns out to be very effective against fall armyworm. So those <laughs> plants are going through the regulatory pipeline now. And, and that will help, I think, make a pathway for us to maybe bring some traits in corn, but we'll see. That's okay, great. Uh, um, Paul, Paul, would you mind going ahead and um, go ahead and speaking your words, or I can also speak for you if you prefer. Unmute. Okay, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering what is the level of involvement of the governments where you work on. And related with the problems that they have, for example, in Africa, as you said. Yeah, so it's, I have to say for us, we have not had the opportunity to be really actively engaged directly in that. But some of our partners like SIP working in, in East Africa and the short version is it's hit or miss. It, it really varies depending from one country to the next. Uh, and I know that Mark's regulatory strategy in trying to get his late blight resistant potatoes to market, he has to sort of update periodically. Is it going to be Kenya first? Is it gonna be Uganda, Ethiopia? Where can we see this going as it's moving ahead? And uh, sometimes you see um, some countries are supportive and then they may have a new advisor that, or a new change in government and that progress towards biosafety laws may revert, uh, you know, that that gets sidelined for a time. So it's, it's pretty hit or miss. I think that you find uh, other countries and other parts of the world, South America, I think is more embracing of biotechnology. Um, Asia, uh, some Asian countries are now, I think a little bit more open to that. So it's, it's a work in progress, definitely. And Ricky had a question that's allied something about building trust. Um, for the technologies. Rick, you want to go ahead and weigh in there? Yeah, I was just curious about your um, perspective, uh, just even for the genetic engineering technologies, uh, which have a higher threshold of acceptance culturally across all the different you know, backgrounds that you interact with. Um, is there a certain method that uh, either you or uh, groups that you collaborate with find more successful in that it's more uh, like a demonstration kind of technique or, uh, you know, trying to build cultural relationships because even something that's uh, conventionally bred that may be a slightly different color than a crop that they're usually used to can be just as rejected as, you know, uh, as anything else. So I, I think it's a really important thing. I just want to get your perspective. Absolutely. No, it's, it's super critical actually. Uh, you know, from the planning stage initially, you don't want to create something that's not going to have a good chance of succeeding. Uh, and you have to be very culturally attuned to um, what it is that people really want to buy and, and has a good flavor, you know, those fundamental things of what they eat um, and things like cooking time. So if you make a variety that takes longer to cook, that requires more fuel. And so there's all kinds of cultural considerations like that. And for us, I think really the key there is to having the right regional partners who understand those kinds of considerations and also allowing them to really star in the work. They have to be the ones who pull this technology. You don't wanna push technology. There has to be some ownership and need and value for it. So that really comes out of the kind of partnerships you form and, and foster. Okay, well, we are actually technically out of time now, and I don't see any more questions posted. Oops, Jean-Luc, how about Jean-Luc giving Jean-Luc the, the final word? <laughs> Can't okay, sorry, I posted it to the wrong place first. 
Um, okay, so in your answer to, to, to Rebecca's question, it seemed like there was a lag. You were working with Monsanto. It seemed like there was a lag between when developing or developed countries were getting the benefit versus when, you know, sub-Saharan African countries were getting the benefit. And I wondered if, you know, there, there could be a mechanism to force Monsanto, which has tremendous expertise in getting this stuff to market, force them to help you to get the benefit to the to sub-Saharan African countries in tandem at the same time as when, you know, it hits the US or whatever. Yes, well, uh, we we prefer rather than trying to force them to coerce them, <laughs> and and uh, that's really not hard as it turns out. The, the issue fundamentally, of course, is that it's a business, and businesses have shareholders, and they expect to make money. Uh, so if they're spending a lot of research dollars on things that aren't going to contribute to that bottom line, that's sort of an issue for them. But they really want to do it in spirit, and. Uh, we found that so we have special features that we have in any of our agreements that we get to have the benefits back of our research for developing country applications. And they're very happy to do that. And they've you know, generally been excellent partners are really supportive of the things that we're doing. And we hope maybe at some point in time, uh, the soybean resistances that we have, we'll be able to work with them to make them available for smallholders. And the corn work I just mentioned we hope to work with Monsanto to help us deploy uh, those lines because Monsanto has been involved in that WEMA corn that I was just describing a moment ago. So they're, they're able to, and especially if you can come with third-party funds, for example, uh, a USDA grant, a USAID grant, then that eliminates the, the problem for them and allows them to, to cooperate because they really want to. Uh, you know, I think there's a very strong interest in, in scientists at Monsanto, just like elsewhere, that they want to see the benefits of the work they do. Um, OK, so I promised to make that the last question, but I'm thinking of reneging by uh, first <laughs> off welcoming anybody who needs to go. Please do. We are over time. But there is one more question. And if Matthew wants to get it off his chest, I will be stand behind him and wait. Thank you both. Um, I just I wanted to ask if you have any opinions as to how moving forward we can balance you know, using these really exciting genetic engineering technologies, but also keep in mind that we want to maintain crop biodiversity and that crop biodiversity also impacts, you know, pollinator diversity and um, there are a lot of ripple effects. So do you see it being very difficult to kind of achieve a balancing act? Yeah, that is, it's a really excellent question. I don't think we've learned how to deal with it yet globally. Uh, you know, on the one hand, there's a lot of advantages to monocultures and whether or not you use transgenics in them or not, it actually is more efficient if you have a uniform wide acreage crop, it's all requiring management at the same times and harvesting and, and all of that, there's a efficiency that comes with monoculture, which helps to make the costs lower. And, and that's just a fact of life that we have to work against to think about how do we uh, achieve the diversity that we need. We, we know that when we're putting, for example, from a crop disease perspective, you put out a big crop like that, you're, you're putting out a buffet, essentially, for one pathogen just to come in and chow its way right through. And that's bad. Uh, it's also bad for other reasons like diversity. So yeah, globally, how we find a balance between wanting to be able to be efficient producers and keep balance of diversity. I, I, it's uh, not a question I'm able to answer, but it's certainly one that we want to address in future and, and diversifying diets and all of those things. Diversity is, is really important. But at least for interest specific diversity as applied to you know, our mutual interest in pest and disease management, the facility with, with which transgenic methods allow you potentially to use multi-line type cultivars is at least a you know, an advantage potentially, right? You're not getting, you know, it's not giving you dietary diversity necessarily, but it would give you that um, genetic diversity, you know, yeah. pest squelching yeah. <laughs> yeah. more more easily than many other ways might do. You know, there although it's still it's, there, we have the issue to do with the regulatory burden. So every time you want to introduce a new um, a cassette or something, you have to go through the regulatory process again, and that's expensive. I, you know, I'd love to see in future ways that we can have a more science focused regulatory process that, that is a little bit more refined and less 
expensive, but still just as stringent um, and is also faster. So if we can get these traits into the field safely and more quickly and less expensively, then, then we start to be able to be more responsive to disease in more real time as well, and to have that kind of diversity that you mentioned. Okay, well, please thank join in in thanking our speaker. Diana, thanks so much again for a great presentation. And thanks to everybody in the audience for joining us for this um, first of the semester. So thanks, well, and, and hopefully I will get back to Cornell sometime and uh, would love to connect with people. Anybody who's, who's interested, please do get in touch. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Yeah, look forward to your in-person visit sometime soon. Thanks, Take Rebecca. Care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.